What I want mostly to point out is that here is an individual who has had the capacity and the will to put his scholarship, his intellect, this gift of God, to the service of the faith. To not only increase our understanding of the Baha'i Revelation in its multiple facets, but also to increase the understanding of others in the non-Baha'i world to the marvels of Baha'u'llah's revelation. Most of you know that for many years, as a member of the National Spiritual Assembly of Canada, as a professor of mathematics at Laval University, he has contributed to this in Canada itself and North America. But you may not know or may not realize that for five years Dr. Hatcher lived in Russia and contributed to the rising awareness of the faith in Russia, particularly among intellectual circles. He spent two and a half years specifically as an invited researcher at the Steklov Mathematical Institute in St. Petersburg. And he was, of course, in contact with many intellectuals, scientists in Russia. And uh, the Russian mind is a very sophisticated mind which does not easily become convinced of anything. And therefore, having had the opportunity of having Dr. Hatcher being in Russia in order to to raise the profile of the Baha'i Faith was certainly an achievement. Let me just say one last word. Dr. Hatcher is mentioned in uh, the Encyclopédie Philosophique Universelle as one of the eight contemporary Platonist philosophers. I think that it is uh, quite an achievement in itself to be recognized by this encyclopedia, which is uh, the largest encyclopedic work prepared since Diderot Encyclopedia in the 18th century. Dr. Hatcher is going to talk to us about love, power, and justice. Dr. Hatcher. I want to say, um, before I start the lecture proper, that I'm very honored and gratified at being invited to give the Hassan Baluzi lectures. Um, I only met Hassan Baluzi once briefly at the International Congress in Royal Albert Hall in London in uh, 1963. Uh, but of course, I, like most of us, have read his many works of scholarship on the faith. And as you know, uh, <clears throat> Douglas Martin and I, when we wrote um, The Baha'i Faith, The Emerging Global Religion, we added a detailed appendix about E.G. Brown and the Baha'i Faith, which draws heavily on uh, Hassan Baluzi's scholarship in this area. Um, so I think that... Um, it will be years and even centuries before we uh, we're able to appreciate the the ultimate effects of what Hazan Baluti did. Uh, the second thing I want to say is, whoever's in charge of this, that it is now two to, uh, two minutes to two o'clock, according to my watch. And <laughs> okay. Uh, because I think it will take about an hour to read the lecture, and I don't want to get into arguments with people who... <laughs> okay. 
The theme of authenticity in human relationships comes to the forefront of world literature in the 19th century. I'm thinking of such authors as Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Ibsen, Victor Hugo, Mark Twain, Ambrose Bierce, and philosophers such as Kierkegaard. This theme of authenticity seems to emerge almost spontaneously in all parts of the world in the literature. And that's why I mentioned writers, both Russian writers and American writers, French writers such as Hugo and so on. With some, of course, um, necessary uh, overgeneralization, the basic theme of this literature is the following. The first is that the true meaning of our existence, human existence, consists in the establishment of authentic relationships between and among human beings. According to this view of the human condition, nothing else can possibly be the meaning of human existence other than the establishment of authentic interhuman relationships. Everything else which has a value has a value only insofar as it contributes to this. At the same time, this literature also presents the human condition as being one in which most human beings are incapable of sustaining authentic relationships. For example, most people will, under certain circumstances, betray their friends and loved ones. Now let me just say a word about what I mean by authenticity, though this will become clearer as I go along. When I speak of an authentic relationship between two people, I mean a totally reciprocal relationship based on the mutual recognition of the universal value that is intrinsic to and inherent in each human being. The mark of authenticity in human relations is the presence of self-sacrificing love or altruism. Now, these perceptions of these writers, of these um, literary geniuses, uh, no less a figure than Harold Bloom uh, in his recent book, uh, The Western Canon, has said that in his opinion, Tolstoy is perhaps the greatest writer since Shakespeare. And that Tolstoy is the only one who approaches Shakespeare's uh, ability to depict the human condition in all of its uh, richness. Uh, be that as it may, uh, these figures that I have named were literary giants. And so their perception uh, of this twin perception that authenticity is the meaning of life and that most human beings are incapable of sustaining authenticity gives rise to certain cultural solutions to this problem. I'll call this the problem of authenticity. For the problem of authenticity is the uh, necessity of um, creating authentic relationships and the difficulty that most people have in doing that. So I want first to look at several different cultural solutions. The thesis that I will be presenting in the first instance is that the great ideologies of the 20th century have been driven by the various cultural solutions to the problem of authenticity. In other words, I've come to believe, and I will defend this thesis in the course of my lecture, that it is not the logical content or the substantive content of these ideologies which has of any significance whatsoever. That these ideologies are all symbolic of the frustrated will to authenticity. This also will become clearer as I go along. So let me uh, give some examples. The first is 
what I perceive to be the Russian solution to this problem. The Russian solution is roughly as follows. Man is condemned to the noble pursuit of an impossible goal. In other words, the Russians say, this is the human condition. We are condemned to the noble pursuit of an impossible goal. The meaning of life then consists not in external success, which is largely considered to be impossible in any case. The meaning of life consists rather than in the nobility and dignity with which one accepts and deals with the often negative realities of the human condition, the sufferings, the injustices. The fundamental expression of human freedom then lies not in external success, but in the care with which one chooses one's friends, which are perceived as comrades in arms in the fight against the sufferings of life. This Russian solution also gives rise to what I call the thirst for absolutes, which I believe is the dominant characteristic of the so-called Russian soul. This thirst for absolutes created conditions for the Russian people to accept the absolutist doctrine of communism, which seeks to establish an absolutely egalitarian society, thus to establish authentic relations by social decree. Marx was, after all, a social determinist. And Marx, incidentally, was not a lover of humanity. He despised common humanity. He called them the lumpen proletariat. Uh, the proletariat was not the suffering people like you and me and the homeless and everything. It was the working class in industrial England. It was a very precise class. And the bourgeoisie was also a very precise class. And so Marx was not, uh, did not see himself as a universal savior. He saw himself as fostering the revolution of the proletariat to overthrow a identifiable class, which was uh, the bourgeoisie. Um, this fundamental social determinism of Marxism enshrines a contradiction, namely the attempt to obtain altruistic behavior without altruistic motivation. You see, Marx made the following statement. It was Lenin who made the statement about religion being the opium of the people. Marx never said that. Marx said something which is even, in fact, more vicious. Marx said, religion is the heart of a heartless world. Religion is the heart of a heartless world. In other words, what Marx was saying, this keeps going down, I'm trying to get a little extra pressure. Um, you see, what Marx was saying was that religion has always claimed to touch and change the human heart. The great religious saviors of the past have talked about the human heart, about love, and so on. But look at the world, Marx would say. Look at the injustice. Look at slavery. Look at the way women are treated. Uh, so it is obvious, Marx said, religion has failed. Religion has failed. And so, why has religion failed? Because human motivation can't be changed. People are essentially selfish and egotistical and aggressive, and that's the way they will always be. But what you can do is change the structure of a society in such a way that you have altruistic behavior even without altruistic motivation. So this was the fundamental internal contradiction, if I may borrow from Marx himself, of Marxism. So that's one solution, the Russian solution. The thirst for absolutes, the noble pursuit of an impossible goal, and the value given to human relations as, um, as a solidarity in the struggle against the sufferings of life. Now, Let's go to the other pole and look at what is the American solution to the problem. 
Since authenticity is difficult to achieve, we dedicate ourselves to creating the best substitutes possible. Of course, this is also a contradiction in that the goal is to achieve fake sincerity. As Oral Roberts' son said uh, when he was receiving the mantle from his father, he said, the most important thing is sincerity. When you can fake that, you've got it made. <laughs> <laughs> So, starting with Hollywood movies in the beginning of the century, which all have about three different plots that are essentially the same, um, leading to the Disney view of life and eventually to Disney worlds, with television beginning in the 1950s and now virtual reality, American culture has become a vast machine for the generation of illusions. So this was the American solution. In other words, in a certain sense, the Russian solution was, if we can't achieve authenticity, at least we won't take substitutes. We will not give up. We will nobly pursue this impossible goal. We will not compromise. Whereas, in a certain sense, the American solution was, well, why not create the best possible substitutes? You know? Europe has been caught in the 20th century between the Russian bear and the American eagle. The dominant European ideology of the 20th century has been fascism. Fascism essentially combines the authoritarianism of communism or Stalinist communism and the elitism of American individualistic capitalism. It is, so to speak, the worst of both worlds. Now, my thesis, again, is that these movements, which have largely determined the character of life in the 20th century, have been mainly driven not by their abstract ideological content, which has been endlessly debated, but rather by the fact that they are expressions, however distorted, of a frustrated will to authenticity. These ideologies served, I believe, as psychological defense mechanisms to avoid confronting the frustration of relational authenticity. They serve to legitimize inauthentic behavior, such as, for example, making heroes out of murderers, rapists, and torturers. In other words, this inauthentic behavior, grossly inauthentic, uh, becomes not a blight on your character, but you become a hero if you torture in the name of Marx or, or Hitler or whatever. So, um, in other words, I'm saying that you will not derive any useful understanding of Russia or Russians by an intellectual analysis of Marxist theory but rather by looking at the thirst for authenticity that made the Russians willing to embark on the communist experiment on such a vast scale. As a matter of fact, it's quite clear that Lenin simply used the vocabulary of communism to foster his own power. There was no bourgeoisie in Russia. There was no industry in Russia. Uh, let me just mention a few facts in this regard. The Russian serfs were freed in 1861 by Tsar Alexander II. At that point, in 1861, 90 percent of the population of Russia was in slavery. 90 percent. Now, black slavery in the United States never attained more than 25% of the population. I'm not saying that that's nothing, of course. But you will have to agree that there is a, nonetheless an immense difference between 25% and 90%. Moreover, the Russian serfs, serfdom was just as cruel and just as brutal as black slavery was in the southern United States. The Russian serf had no rights as a human being. He could be tortured, maimed, killed with impunity. 
He had no legal redress whatsoever. He was not a legal person. He was entirely owned by his master. And of course, those of you who've read, you know, the novels of, say, Dostoevsky and so on, uh, you know, the, the descriptions of, of what was done to these people. And Tolstoy also writes about this. Now, as I say, the, the serfs were freed in 1861, so then they became a vast illiterate peasantry. And within one generation, you had the communist revolution which re-enslaved them. So that's the history of Russia in the 20th century, okay? One generation out of slavery, they were re-enslaved by Lenin, who using putatively the ideology of Marx, simply decreed that the peasants were the proletariat. As I say, there was no proletariat in Russia. There was no industry in Russia. <laughs> so there was no proletariat, nor was there a, um, a bourgeoisie. There was just a thin layer of intellectuals and aristocrats living almost totally in either Moscow or St. Petersburg. And that was the structure of Russian society, this vast illiterate peasantry capped with this handful of intellectuals and aristocrats located almost entirely in two cities. So, as I say, at that time, in the beginning of the 20th century, everybody was talking about socialism. In Germany, France, England, everywhere, the United States, Everybody was talking about socialism, but the only country that undertook a socialist experiment on such a massive scale was Russia. So what I'm suggesting is that the reason why they did that has nothing to do with socialist theory whatsoever. It had to do with the spiritual condition of the Russian people. In other words, what I'm suggesting, among other things, is that whatever you think, however misguided we may regard this experiment, it is also an amazing amount of courage <laughs> uh, that is shown in the willingness to suffer such dislocations in the name of the pursuit of an egalitarian society. Similarly, in my view, we cannot understand America in terms of the endless public prattle about democracy and human rights but rather when we see that American culture is primarily about self-indulgent attempts to avoid even the minimal degree of pain and suffering and self-restraint that is necessary to the achievement of authenticity in human relationships. This, I think, explains the insensitivity of Americans to the prevailing suffering that exists in that society. According to official government statistics of the U.S., one-fifth of the population lives below the poverty line. Most of these are single black mothers. And nobody cares about these people. Uh, because, again, there's the myth that America is a land of opportunity. Everybody can go as far as their abilities can carry them. Everybody's free to pursue their success. So if these people have chosen to have babies out of wedlock instead of getting a good education and a good job, well, that's their free choice. There's no social injustice and so on, you see. So how does one remain insensitive to this degree of suffering? I think it's only uh, by this it only shows simply that, as I say, this public discourse about human rights and so on is in fact, again, a defense mechanism against uh, the realization of um, that these relationships are not authentic. Nor can any analysis of the trivial but pernicious doctrines of national socialism explain to us why in only one generation uh, Hitler was able to lead the German people into overthrowing all of the fundamental values enshrined in their philosophical and cultural tradition. Recall that only a few generations intervene between Kant's categorical imperative and the Nazi death camps. Now, look at the doctrines of national so socialism, you know, bread, freedom, work, and so on, and all of these things. And is that going to tell you? what enabled Hitler 
to convert the German people from this, uh, you know, with their philosophical tradition into a people in one generation who did all of these things? I think not, you see. The Baha'i solution to the problem of achieving authenticity in human relationships is roughly the following. It is indeed impossible for us to achieve this alone, but with the conscious help of God, it is possible and practically achievable. Indeed, this is the very purpose for which Baha'u'llah has come. In other words, the key to establishing authentic lateral relationships between and among human beings lies in establishing an authentic vertical relationship both individually and collectively, between God and ourselves. The fundamental relationship of human existence is an ongoing dialogue between God and ourselves. We can thus say that Soviet Marxism deliberately excluded God and attempted to achieve authenticity in terms of a lateral dialectic instead of a vertical dialogue. Marxism is the two-dimensional projection of a three-dimensional process. Americans have not only included God, but have attempted to appropriate him as an aid to the fabrication of their various substitutes for authenticity. Everything from drug euphoria to sexual indulgence is somehow seen as an expression of a sincere quest for authentic spirituality rather than as the ephemeral, inauthentic pursuits they in fact are. The fundamental question we now ask is the following. If indeed the pursuit of relational authenticity is the fundamental task and meaning of human existence, why has there been so little of it? What in our history has prevented us from achieving authenticity? The fact that authenticity has not prevailed in our history is witnessed by the persistence in our history of fundamental injustices such as slavery, economic exploitation, racism, and the oppression of women. We inherit a history of injustice. Recall again that authentic relationships, as I define them, are symmetrical. Whereas these relationships of slavery, domination, and so on, are asymmetrical relationships. Baha'u'llah's answer to this question, that is, why we inherit this history of injustice, is the pursuit of power. The root of historical injustice has been the pursuit of power, not the exercise of power or even the misuse of power, but the pursuit of power as an end in itself. Well, let me read a quotation where Baha'u'llah talks about this. He says, And among the realms of unity is the unity of rank and station. It redoundeth to the exaltation of the cause, glorifying it among all peoples. Ever since the seeking of preference and distinction came into play, the world hath been laid waste. It hath become desolate. There he says it. Ever since the seeking of preference and distinction. He doesn't say preference and distinction. He says the act of seeking it as an end in itself. Ever since that this has come into play, the world hath been laid waste. It has become desolate. Those who have quaffed from the ocean of divine utterance and fixed their gaze upon the realm of glory should regard themselves as being on the same level as the others, and in the same station. Were this matter to be definitely established and conclusively demonstrated through the power and might of God, the world would become as the Abha paradise. Well, we say that that's what the Baha'i faith is about, is bringing about the kingdom of God on earth, and we know that the Abha paradise is the metaphor that Baha'u'llah uses to describe the kingdom of God. So Baha'u'llah is telling us right here, what is the essential condition for bringing about the kingdom of God on earth? In other words, for accomplishing the goal, the stated goal of the Baha'i faith. It is the renunciation of the pursuit of power. Were this matter, those, he says, who have fixed their ocean and so on and so on, 
fix their gaze on the ocean of divine utterance and so on, should regard themselves as being on the same level and station as the others. In other words, they should renounce the pursuit of power. The only way you can consider yourself on the same level and station as everybody else is not to seek power over other people, right? And he says, were this matter to be definitely established, then the Abha paradise would come. Indeed, man is noble inasmuch as each one is a repository of the sign of God. So, each person does have powers. He's not saying that power doesn't exist. Nevertheless, to regard oneself as superior in knowledge, learning, or virtue, or to exalt oneself, or to seek preference, is a grievous transgression. Now, notice again. He's not saying that there aren't people who are superior in knowledge, learning, or virtue. What he's saying is that whoever these people are, they're not the ones who think that they are superior in knowledge, learning, or virtue. Okay? Let me read it again. Nevertheless, to regard oneself as superior in knowledge, learning, or virtue, or exalt oneself, or to seek preference, is a grievous transgression. So by the very fact of considering yourself superior to somebody else, you have made yourself morally inferior to that person. So, in this and other passages, Baha'u'llah gives us the key to understanding our history. Power is pursued either socially by occupying those roles to which society has attributed power and status, or else by competition, which is the search to outperform the other in some manner with a view to attributing a super value to yourself as the winner of the competition. Now notice that power relationships are intrinsically asymmetrical. See, this is very important. It's not an accident. It's not that we have to pursue power on others, but still try to mitigate it with a little bit of love. We cannot each have power over the other at the same time and in the same way. In other words, it's logically impossible that I have power over Perry, even he has power over me at the same time and in the same way. This is logically impossible. So the pursuit of power or power-based relations are intrinsically asymmetrical. Similarly, we cannot each outperform the other in the same respect and at the same time. Competition is thus also inherently asymmetrical. Now, why do we pursue power? So, the, the conclusion there, which I, I thought was clear, but maybe I should say explicitly then, is that uh, if we say that authenticity is the goal, and authenticity is a reciprocal relationship, then it is absolutely clear that we can never achieve authenticity as long as power orientation and competition is the basis of our relationships. Because they inevitably lead to asymmetrical relationships of dominance. Now, why do we pursue power? Well, of course, there is one answer which many materialists give and which Marx gave, which is that people pursue power because uh, people are, uh, are just animals, because people are intrinsically aggressive and egotistical and they always want power and so on and so on. However, the Baha'i Faith gives another answer, and so I, I won't waste time sort of refuting the, uh, the materialist answer, though I do do this in the Love, Power, and Justice book. I do I have uh, a couple of pages where I do go into detail into a refutation of the materialist viewpoint as being unscientific. But the Baha'i Faith puts forth the following proposition that the pursuit of power is really the pursuit of self-value attribution. We exercise power over another by threats and promises. We can give or withhold something the other desires or else we can protect the other or not from some negative consequence he fears. 
Such power thus allows us to compel the other to recognize our value. He has to reckon with us if we have power over him. Similarly, when we win a competition by outperforming another, others attribute to us a super value as the winner of the competition. Thus, we pursue power to acquire value. We feel that we need to acquire value because we perceive ourselves as having no intrinsic or inherent value. And to think of oneself as without value is tantamount to psychological suicide. So let me sum up. The root cause of the prevalent injustice in our history is the pursuit of power. And the root cause of the pursuit of power is our self-perception as intrinsically valueless. Now, Baha'u'llah has stated that the purpose of his coming into the world is to bring justice. The establishment of justice is the very purpose of Baha'u'llah. Now, we inherit this history of injustice, but notice that there's nothing we can undo, do to undo this history of injustice. It will forever be true through all the worlds of God. It will always have been true that the blacks were enslaved by the whites in the southern United States. Nothing, no future thing will ever change that fact. All of the injustices of the past exist forever. So if we insist, as people tend to do, that the only way to achieve justice is to undo the past, <laughs> then we will never have justice. We, in fact, have no control over the past. And we have very little control over the future. The only thing we have any degree of control over is the present, how we act at the present. So, we cannot have a future that will be different from our past if we continue to act in the present the way we've acted in the past. That's logic. All right? Let me say this again. <laughs> because it has the satisfying ring of truth. Right? <laughs> if we act in the present the way we have acted in the past, then our future will be like our past. Can anybody refute this argument? And therefore, it follows that the only way to have a future different from our past is to change the way we act in the present. There is no other way. So all of the discussions and the conferences and everything else you want to talk about only have meaning insofar as they end up with changed human behavior at the present moment. Until that happens, our future will continue to be a repetition of the past, and injustice will remain. Thus, the creative minds of the 19th century intuitively perceived and articulated in their works the fundamental problem that now faces humanity as explained by the manifestation of God himself. The only means of bringing about justice in the world is for us to renounce the pursuit of power and replace it by the pursuit of authenticity in all our relationships, both individual and collective. How do we do this? How do we go about renouncing the pursuit of power? Well, first we must... How do we do this? How do we go about renouncing the pursuit of power? Well, first we must remove the motivation for pursuing power. 
First, then, we must gain the universal recognition of intrinsic value, both in ourselves and others. This value is nothing else but the inherent capacities of each human soul, more particularly the fundamental capacities of consciousness, of mind, of heart, and will. In fact, it is this unique, uniquely human consciousness which defines us as human beings. Let me give a very simple example of this, but maybe it's so simple that it's almost silly, but but bear with me. Uh, why consciousness flows everything else? Our understanding, our feelings, our affections, our will, everything flows from this consciousness. And every human being has this. Every human being has this. The Baha'i writings tell us that these capacities are inherent in the very nature of the non-material, immortal soul of each individual, and thus intrinsic. And they are shared by all humans, the Hala tells us, as you know, that every single human soul has the capacity to reflect all of the attributes of God. I mean, it could have been that some souls could reflect some attributes and other souls other attributes, but Baha'u'llah says no. Every single human soul has the capacity to reflect all of the attributes of God. So, this is, if you will, the logical definition of a human being. The human being is that unique being or entity in creation whose essential reality is the capacity to reflect all of the attributes of God. As Baha'u'llah explains, everything else in creation reflects some attributes of God, but not all of them. Because this value of the human being is intrinsic and universal, it is objective. That is, it exists independently of whether or not we perceive it. You see, for the materialists, if you think of yourself a certain way, that's the way you are. I mean, there's no other self, there's no other spiritual self back of this material self uh, that is the real you. The real you is just what you, is just a composite of all your feelings and thoughts. But from the Baha'i writings we know that there is this objectively existing uh, non-composite entity which is the soul and which is the locus of these capacities. Now notice that this intrinsic spiritual capacity of the soul is the source of all extrinsic values. Well, let me give a simple example, which again may be so simple as to be silly, but I'll take the risk nonetheless. Here I have a $20 Canadian bill. Now, we say that this is valuable. This is an extrinsic value. This is money. It's valuable. And what we mean by this is that if I'm sick and there's medicine in a pharmacy that will help me, I can go give this piece of paper and I can get this medicine. Or if I'm hungry, I can give this piece of paper and get food to eat that will satisfy my hunger. Notice that this value is totally extrinsic. It is not intrinsic in this piece of paper. This piece of paper in itself is nothing but a mass of colored fibers, which serves no intrinsic good. I can't eat it. It will not nourish me. It will not heal any diseases. It is intrinsically worthless. All of the value is symbolic. And what does this value derive from? It derives from the capacity, the spiritual capacity of human beings to sustain certain relationships of mutual trust and so on. So in other words, these intrinsic capacities of the human being are the source of all extrinsic value. We've just lost the sense of the connection between these extrinsic values. We objectify these extrinsic values, which are in fact subjective, and we subjectify the spiritual values, which are in fact objective. Or put it another way. 
a dog or a monkey has all of the physical senses that you and I do. So the monkey can see the, this paper and see the greenness of it or whatever else you want. I think monkeys are not colorblind, right? Dogs are. Um, uh, but he can, he can sense, he can feel this paper and so on. But he has no access to this symbolic value of the paper. Only a human being has access to that symbolic value because that value arises from the nature of relationships which are sustained by human beings. Destroy these relationships and you destroy the value of this thing. Okay? Therefore, in the measure that we recognize and become aware of our intrinsic value, we become secure in our sense of self-worth and are thus freed from the power imperative. The lust for power recedes within us and we are free to share our value with others rather than seek something from them. Now remember that human behavior is determined not by objective reality, but rather by our perception of reality. Thus, if we perceive ourselves as having no intrinsic value, we will fall into power-seeking behavior and act as if we did not have this intrinsic value even though objectively we have it. Thus the recognition of intrinsic value is the knowledge of our true selves which Baha'u'llah has equated with the knowledge of God, the supreme purpose of human existence. This recognition of our true selves, of our intrinsic value, is of course a process. We gain this true self-knowledge, this knowledge of the God-created reality that is within us, that indeed is us. We must begin to act as we gain this knowledge. We must begin to act in the light of this knowledge. We must change the way we act, for as we've already seen, it is, the only, it is only changed behavior that will lead to a new future. We must deliberately renounce the pursuit of power and dominance over others and replace it by the pursuit of justice and love, which leads to authenticity. In the past, we sacrificed justice to the pursuit of power, thus creating our history of injustice. Justice can be defined as the conditions necessary for love to flourish. The goal of the Baha'i faith is unity, as we know, and you can make a little equation, which I do in the book, unity equals love plus justice. Thus, the establishment of unity lies in replacing the pursuit of power by the pursuit of justice. And once justice is created, this is the conditions under which love is born and flourishes. Uh, notice one other thing. Love is the one thing which cannot be commanded by power. You give me all the power in the world, I can make you suffer, even kill you. I can maybe force you into moral compromise, make you denounce your neighbor, do all sorts of things. The one thing I can't do is make you love me. You see? So love is actually more powerful than power because love creates power. But power cannot create love. That's why the pursuit of power instead of the pursuit of love is such a disastrous thing. Now, another aspect of renouncing the pursuit of power is the renunciation of competition and replacing competition by the pursuit of excellence. So I want to take a few minutes here to make the point that the pursuit of excellence and competition are not the same thing. Competition is the horizontal comparison between the performances of two different individuals at the same time. Uh, if Pierre-Yves, I'm sorry to take you as a victim, Pierre-Yves, but why not? <laughs> if Pierre-Yves and I are competing to see who can play the violin the best, well, how will this proceed? I mean, we will play the violin at 
before the same audience at roughly the same time, and people will observe uh, whether or not which one of us can play better than the other. So this is the horizontal comparison between the performances of two different individuals at roughly the same time. Pursuit of excellence is the vertical comparison between two different performances by the same individual at different times. If I can play the violin better tomorrow than I could today, that's the pursuit of excellence. That's the vertical comparison between two different performances by the same individual, me, at the same time. Now, these two pursuits then are clearly different. However, of course, what is often said, as you know, is, well, nonetheless, um, competition stimulates the pursuit of excellence. Well, let's look at this. Let's again suppose that Pierre Eve and I are competing as to who can play the violin the best. What are the strategies that I can use to pursue this competition? Well, one strategy is, of course, to pursue excellence. I can improve my performance over time. And if I do this, then I have a chance of outperforming Pierre-Yves. The problem with this strategy is that Pierre-Yves can also improve his performance over time. Right? And I have no guarantee a priori, regardless of what the present configuration is, no matter how much better I am right now than he is or whatever, I have no a priori guarantee that Pierre-Yves won't find a way of progressing much faster than me and eventually outperform me. Now notice, if pursuit of excellence is our goal, there's no problem. The world will be better off with two good violin players than two mediocre violin players where one happens to play better than the other. But if competition is the goal, then there is another strategy which is surer, quicker, and takes much less energy. That is sabotage. <laughs> I can simply sabotage the performance of Pierre-Yves and then I'm certain to be able to play better than he is. Notice that sabotage cannot lead to the pursuit of excellence because it certainly does not improve his performance and it takes energy away from my own performance. Therefore, sabotage is the optimum strategy for winning a competition and it is never a viable strategy for pursuing excellence. Therefore, the pursuit of excellence and competition are two different things. Now, notice that if the pursuit of excellence is our goal, we can even cooperate. In other words, suppose I find a technique, a new technique for the left hand. Why, well, I could show Pierre-Yves, you know, maybe he would never discover that. And why not? If we're both pursuing excellence, I'm just as happy if he improves as if I approve. You see? If you begin to think about these things, you will realize, and I can only urge you to think about them, you will realize how deep competition is embedded in all your relationships with everybody you're relating with. The myth that confuses competition with the pursuit of excellence also confuses the universal with the merely general, and it results in what I call the supervaluation of the special. Whenever we encounter each other, we can choose to emphasize whatever differentiates us or whatever unites us, what we have in common. By its very nature, competition puts the emphasis on our differences. Thus, when competition becomes the prevalent mode of human interaction, such as in the highly individualistic society of North America, the supervaluation of the special is the result. For example, let's look at whom our society gives its resources. Who are the highest paid people in our society? Well, professional athletes. Why? Because they have special ability. They have, through competition, demonstrated special ability. They can put a ball through a hoop 
or a, or a hockey puck in the net better than you and I can. And they get millions of dollars for doing this. On the other hand, motherhood in our society is viewed as ordinary. It's not special and therefore it is not very much worthy of uh, consideration. In other words, the idea is anybody can be a mother. You know, it's nothing to be a mother. In fact, as we know that many of our young people now are concerned about how not to, to become mothers. Uh, and that's another part of the problem. <laughs> so motherhood is viewed as ordinary and being a rock star or a cinema star or an athlete is viewed as special. However, if we look at the reality of the situation, we can see that, in fact, motherhood is not ordinary at all. Examine, I invite you to observe the interaction between an ordinary mother and her children. You will see that from the moment a child is born, the mother will sacrifice her own needs for the needs of her child from the moment that child is born until it becomes an autonomous adult, and sometimes even afterwards. In other words, the mother is not God. She gets tired, she gets hungry, she gets sick. But if she perceives that her child is tired or hungry or sick, she will satisfy the needs of that child before she satisfies her own needs. Ordinary mothers do this. Now I submit that this isn't ordinary at all. It's extraordinary. Moreover, clearly motherhood is the most vital role in society because the whole future of the human race depends on it. I mean, suppose, to make it clear, that one generation of women refused absolutely to play this role. That would be the end of the human race, literally. I think that if there was no more Michael Jordan and professional basketball, I think we could live quite a while, you know? <laughs> you know? So think about it. There must be something a little bit wrong. I mean, just a little bit wrong with the society that pays $36 million a year to Michael Jordan and where one-fifth of the population, most of them single mothers, are living below the poverty line. According to official statistics, God knows what the reality is. All right? There must be something a little wrong, no? I mean, maybe somewhere. You know, maybe it's more than just, you know, the war on poverty or something like that. Maybe there are some more fundamental value differentials going on here. Well, I would like to offer the thesis that this confusion of the universal and the ordinary results from an uncritical application of laws governing material values to those governing spiritual values. If you walk into any economics course, the first day of Economics 101, you will learn essentially the whole course, which is the basic principle of economics, which is competition for rarity. You would say, I mean, if everything was abundant and freely available, there would be no need for an economy. I mean, every individual could just go get what he needs. He wouldn't, there wouldn't be any interdependence. There would be no need for work or anything. So the existence of rarity and the competition for that which is rare is the basis of all economics. This principle of competition for rarity is derived from the fact that material values are diminished when they're shared. If I have an apple and I have to share it with you, we each have part of an apple. But spiritual values are enhanced, not diminished when they're shared. If I have a good idea and I share it with you, we both have a good idea. This is a, 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 an association dedicated to learning. What is learning? It's sharing good ideas. You go to hear a talk and you say, he had a good idea, he had a good insight. Well, that's what you go. You go to share good ideas. We have institutions. We spend money for universities. Why? Because we recognize that the sharing of the spiritual value of 
good ideas enhances their value. Or if I have love and I share it with you, is the love diminished? No, it's enhanced. In fact, the surest way to throttle love is not to share it, right? Notice also that love is the only truly win-win relationship between human beings because love is experienced positively both by giver and receiver. Even justice, even pure justice is not always perceived, is not already experienced positively by the person who's the object of the, uh, of the action. But love is always experienced positively both by giver and receiver. And this is uh, the passage that was read uh, previous uh, in the devotional period is exactly this statement of Abdu Baha, where he says that love is the universal value, unconditional value. That is, an increase in love is an increase in value under all conditions, under all conditions. Thus, the logic of spiritual values is cooperation for universality, whereas the logic of material values is competition for the special. We have unconsciously superimposed onto spiritual values the laws governing material values, and therefore we have recreated our human relationships in the image of our lower nature. And it is we who do this. It is not because it's our intrinsic nature to do this. These are choices that we have made. Motherhood is universal. And it is universal because it is an expression of the intrinsic values of love, of trust, and self-sacrifice. People sometimes challenge me, well, give me an example of something that's ordinary and not universal. Okay, sickness. Everybody gets sick, it's very ordinary, but it's not universal. And the, the way that motherhood is treated in our society, in effect, treats motherhood as if it were an illness. You see. This again shows what a perversion of values is involved in this. So, I conclude. We have established that the central problem of the modern world is to replace the pursuit of power-based asymmetrical relations with the pursuit of authentic relations based on altruistic love. On the personal level, such a choice is within the scope of the will of each individual. Indeed, it is for this very purpose that God has endowed each of us with our intrinsic spiritual capacities. But what of the collectivity? What are we to do about those who refuse to make this choice, to renounce the pursuit of power? Baha'u'llah's answer to this question is his covenant. Baha'u'llah has constructed an ingenious system of administration of human affairs in which it is literally impossible to succeed in pursuing power. Now, of course, we know some of the features of this, such as the collective exercise of decision-making authority, uh, the electoral process without nomination in candidates, uh, the minimum of outer rewards for service on institutions, which diminishes the tendency for the egotistic individual to seek such offices or to survive in them if he does succeed. <laughs> However, the ultimate and complete guarantee is and can only be the conferred infallibility of the universal house of justice. This alone is our ultimate assurance that no one will, will or ever can succeed in the pursuit of power in the Baha'i order. As its influence spreads in the world, so will the pursuit of power be defeated. The covenant of Baha'u'llah, and in particular the infallibility of the House of Justice, is the rock 
against which the ship of the pursuit of power will ultimately founder and destroy itself. The covenant of Baha'u'llah is that divine barrier which alone will separate forever the age of injustice and power seeking from the age of justice, of love, and of true and enduring unity.